Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Psych Files, the podcast that tries to show you that what you learned in your psychology class is actually applicable to everyday life. As we talk about how having passion for your work is maybe overrated. In fact, maybe it's something that we're deceiving ourselves about. You'll hear that a lot, right? People want to have passion for their work. In fact, a couple of years ago, I went to visit a relative, and he is in the the insurance business. So being a psychology teacher, we didn't really have a whole lot in common, as you can imagine. He invited us out to lunch with a couple of friends of his. And so we were sitting down, and, it, you know, it's a little bit awkward. I didn't know them at all. So I said to her, so, uh, you know, to the woman next to me, I said, well, what is it you do? And she said to me, I'll never forget this, she said, well, you know, I've discovered that my passion is mutual funds. Now, as you can imagine, uh, I don't really know much about investing and uh, and finance and matters of that sort. I know what mutual funds are, but it I, I remember it was one of those moments, you know, where maybe you go to a party and you meet someone and you say, "Hey, what do you do?" which is a typical question, and that person responds with something that you just cannot relate to at all. So it was an awkward moment there. But it was the way she put it that she had a passion for mutual funds that I I guess I just didn't know if you could have a passion for that. Now I'm I'm reconsidering that. I actually am it right now. But it was a little bit awkward and it, and I think back on it now it seems like in in our culture, I guess I'm referring to the one I'm most familiar with here in the US, this idea that you ought to be passionate about our work is just um, accepted. And you hear it a lot. I think maybe you hear it a lot from motivational speakers. And, uh, in fact, there are uh, some quite well-known books out there. I even know the titles without ever having read them. For example, there's Do What You Love and the Money Will Come. Probably you've heard of that. Or people have said to you, If you didn't have to worry about money, what would you do? Oh, it's an interesting question. You know, I think most people would answer that they would, you know, hang out on a, I don't know, in the south of France or something like that. But, you know, it's intended to get you to think about what you're passionate about, uh, making the most out of your innate talents. So all of this idea, I think, grows out of uh, sort of the human potential movement back and started really sort of back in the 60s. But I think it's also part of the American culture, the individualism that we embrace. But I don't know. I wonder if maybe we are putting too much pressure on ourselves by asking ourselves to be passionate about our work or to find passion in what we do. So where's the connection to psychology? Probably the the biggest name uh, I connect immediately to this is Abraham Maslow, right, who talked about his uh, concept of self-actualization. So self-actualization, self-esteem, all these sorts of things that psychologists frequently talk about. And I remember when I was a young man in college, I was convinced that uh, I needed to be a self-actualizing person and that I would never be happy unless I found work that tapped into my talents. And I have to admit, I, I, like, I think like many Americans, sort of look down on any sort of skilled labor. As uh, and I think the, there's a kind of a running joke among uh, comedians, I guess, about work that Americans won't do. But uh, it may come from the fact that you know the ours is such a wealthy country. But we are hung up on this idea. I have a niece who is you know, in that college age and that young 20s and looking ahead to her, what she'll do in life. And she's very worried about not finding work that she's passionate about. So let me take you to a, a, um, a TED Talk that I was listening to. TED Talks, www.ted.com. I ought to be familiar with that. Many of you are. Very interesting speakers who come to this conference on technology education no, technology, entertainment, and design. And they talk about what they do. Really very interesting. I want to check that out. So I was uh, driving along, listening to one of them, and it was by a guy named Mike Rowe. And perhaps you've seen him on his show, and it's called Dirty Jobs. And uh, maybe you've seen this. It's kind of an interesting show in which he uh, participates in jobs that you would probably think are uh, not very pleasant. Here are some of them. Here's one called a roadkill collector. That's a job. 
a chicken sexer. I actually have heard of that one, people who determine the sex of chickens. That's kind of an important uh, thing to do there because, of course, only the hens will bring you the eggs. Uh, let's see, an alligator egg collector. Sounds dangerous. A tar rigger. <laughs> that sounds like a kind of a dirty job, a rough job, a tar rigger. So he goes and, and he does all these jobs. And, um, you know, they're they're tough. But he makes a very interesting point after he talks about one of his experiences. It's kind of humorous. So, uh, you know, I suggest you, well, I'll embed the video into um, the show notes for this episode. At the end of his um, little summary of some of the jobs that he's done, he talks about how he believes that in this country, in the United States, quote, we've declared war on work. We tend to portray people who do these kinds of jobs. Maybe they're punchlines, you know, Joe the plumber. Uh, you know, so we either make them heroes or punchlines. So we portray these people poorly on TV as stereotypes. He believes, as a result, there are declining applications to trade schools. And the thing he wants to point out is that the people who do these jobs, they are not unhappy. And we, I think, would imagine that they would be, right? If you think about being a, a tar rigger, you probably would think you'd be unhappy. And, and when, uh, if I think about being a, um, you know, a mutual fund investor, I, I don't know. I, I might think, although I'm beginning to change my mind, that I would be unhappy because it doesn't tap into my quote-unquote talents. And yet one of the important points that Mike Rowe makes is that without, first off, that these people are not unhappy. They're not worried about following their passion. They're doing good work and that we have forgotten how important that work is. In fact, I was just the other day heard on the, the radio that people were saying that the economy won't change until, what is it they say, the shovels hit the dirt, until the important infrastructure type of work is being done in this country. The connection here is that psychology, I think, has contributed to this focus, this obsession with being passionate, and yet... People who do work you might think you'd be unhappy doing actually aren't unhappy. And so that brings me to, would you believe, another TED Talk, a psychologist, Dan Gilbert. And I listened to this one a couple of years ago, and I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wasn't sure of the connection until I heard uh, Mike Rose talk. But Dan Gilbert talked, and, and he, uh, um, he has a book. It's called Stumbling on Happiness. And it's interesting because he talks about how we actually are happy despite the fact that we think we wouldn't be. So I think I've mentioned this before. He points out that, uh, that we, we tend to think that if we win the lottery, we would be very, very happy. People who win the lottery, we find, about a year later, are not significantly happier than they were before they won. He also points to a few other people. He talks about Pete Best. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Pete Best was the original drummer of the Beatles, famous rock group back in the 60s, and uh, he was thrown out of the Beatles and replaced by Ringo Starr. So Dan Gilbert has a quote from uh, Pete Best, who's still working today as a drummer, and he says things along the lines of uh, how he's, he's fine about it all and couldn't imagine life being better than what it is now, glad he wasn't a part of the Beatles. Now that sounds like it could be rationalization, you know, sour grapes, but is it? You would think, if you were kicked out of the Beatles, that you'd be, what, unhappy for the rest of your life. But it appears Pete Best is not unhappy. So when we think about how unhappy we would be if we're not in a job that taps into our passion, maybe we're wrong. A couple other points that Dan Gilbert makes. He says that we have an experience simulator... In other words, we try to imagine some situations, right? We all try to imagine what would something be like. And he said in some cases it's accurate, and his example is, can you imagine liver and onion ice cream? Now, you could probably imagine that and how bad that would taste. But he says in other in aspects of life, this simulator doesn't work well because we tend to focus on only one aspect and not the details. So, for example... Would winning the lottery make you happier? You focus on that singular event, winning the lottery. But you don't imagine that three or four months later, six months later, doesn't their life return to something quite normal? Imagine the idea of 
you having a job that's not your passion. You know what? Would you be really unhappy? The final point that Dan Gilbert makes is that we, that we tend to synthesize happiness in his terms. We come to like what we have. He says that we can come to feel good about our lives no matter what the circumstances are. And I tend to agree with him here. I, I think that, for example, if I was you know, in mutual funds, do you know what? I bet it's possible that I would find something about investing and finance that's intriguing, that's perplexing, that might even be exciting. And I'm brought back to an earlier episode in which I talked about the motivation to learn, in which we pointed out that people are drawn in. Anyone is drawn in to things like puzzles, contradictions, things that have lack of closure. We're just, it's sort of like the, the popularity of the, um, the Da Vinci Code. People are drawn in to something that has bits and pieces to it that we can't pull together, no matter what it is. There is another job satisfaction theory that's worth, that actually ties into some of this motivation to learn. And it's called job enrichment theory. It's been around for a while by Hackman and Oldham. And they found out that there are actually certain aspects of a job that could be emphasized that would make it more satisfying and more motivating. And one of them is an interesting one. They call it identity. But uh, the worst case scenario type of job that might be for some people uh, make make you unhappy would be an assembly line, right? You, things just come by you and you put one piece on. Sounds pretty monotonous. But one way that a job like that could be interesting is to enrich it by giving people who do it a sense of identity instead of uh, just putting one piece onto a, let's say it's a toaster. What if you were involved in putting all the pieces on a toaster? What if you could have the opportunity to take pride in knowing that you contributed significantly to the creation of some product instead of just having put one bolt on. That's the idea of identity. And people like that. That does give people a sense of pride. Another one is challenge, right? People like to be challenged, to have problems to solve, things to figure out. Significance is another one. Feeling that what you're doing is important in the world. And I think that's something that Mike Rowe and the Dirty Jobs guy would would say that the people who do, the people that he's met who do these jobs believe that their work is important. And it is important. We just tend to, I think we tend to do two things. I think in our culture we tend to look down on these jobs. And we're incorrect, as Dan Gilbert would point out, when we think that we'd be unhappy do, doing them. Well, uh, one of the other things that Hackman and Oldham in their job enrichment theory point to is the idea of feedback. So knowing how you're doing, how well are you doing in your job, can lead to satisfaction. I think the moral here is, yes, pursue your talents. If you are a college student and next month you're going to graduate, you know, in May you're going to graduate from college, or if you're a person who is out of work because of our economy, you should know what your talents are and try to find work that matches them. You know, that's worked for me. But you know what? Don't exaggerate how much worse off you think you would be if you don't get to do what you want. We can be happy with our circumstances. And this happiness is not less good than what you might refer to as natural happiness. The happiness that, you know, you experience when you get what you want. You think that is better than not getting what you want. But we can be happy in a lot of circumstances, more than you might imagine. You'll hear, in fact, you'll hear a lot of people say that they don't really like the work so much, but they enjoy the people, right? I mean, we can find parts of work that we may not particularly love. We can find parts of it that we really do love, that really do make us happy. So if psychologists have contributed to this focus on passion for your work, it's unfortunate but I think we have. I'll leave you with a, a quote from a book. Uh, someone gave this to me recently. It's a book by Ann Patchett, and it's called simply What Now? And it actually comes from a commencement that she gave at Sarah Lawrence College. She was a graduate of there. So she says, quote, 
just because things hadn't gone the way I planned didn't necessarily mean they had gone wrong. The secret is finding the balance between going out to get what you want and being open to the thing that actually winds up coming your way. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that quote. So that was Ann Patchett. Hope you found this interesting. And as I say, I'll have links to these, uh, these two videos, uh, the one Mike Rowe gave from Dirty Jobs and the other one from Dan Gilbert. Very interesting insights, I think, into human nature.